Now, I'm going to talk to you today mainly about lifestyle factors and their potential role in reducing the risk of dementia. Now, there's really any number of topics we could talk about, any number of lifestyle factors we could address. But today, I'm just going to focus on a few that we've been researching lately that have really shown a bit of promise. So I'm going to focus on sleep, diet, and also a healthy heart. So I'm going to take a bit of time just to give some background and explain why this research is important. So we know that the population is aging. As you can see here, in 2012, there was 13.7% of the population aged over 65. And by the year 2040, we expect there to be about 21% of people older than age 65. And really, this is something tremendous that we ought to be celebrating. Uh, it's, it's fantastic that lifespans are increasing. But it does create a number of challenges, both for medicine and for society. So for example, one consequence of our population becoming older is that we're now seeing an increase in the number of people who are getting dementia. And the simple reason for that is that age is the biggest risk factor for dementia. So Alzheimer's disease, which is the leading cause of dementia, accounts, is a sixth leading cause of death in the United States. And more than 5 million Americans are currently living with Alzheimer's disease. And because the population continues to increase, we expect this number could get as high as 16 million by 2050. But this is not really just a problem for the US. Indeed, it's not just a problem for high-income countries such as Australia, the UK, Canada, <coughs> the US. It's really a problem on a global scale. So there are 131.5 million people estimated to be living with dementia by 2050. And 68% will be in low and middle income countries. So this really does require a call to arms to address this. Now I'd just like to explain a few terms so we're all on the same page because I know it can be confusing to understand what the difference is between say dementia and Alzheimer's disease for example. So dementia is this umbrella term which describes a bunch of symptoms. These symptoms affect the brain and they typically affect thinking and memory. And what happens is you get this decline in thinking and memory over time. And in dementia, this decline in thinking and memory is significant enough to disrupt someone's everyday functioning. So it does impair your ability to go about your life on a day-to-day -day basis. So as we age, some degree of forgetfulness can be expected. But with dementia, it really is significant and it does impact your life. Now, there are a number of different causes of dementia. And the most common cause is Alzheimer's disease. And this accounts for about 40 to 70%. Another common cause is vascular disease. So uh, vascular disease in the brain or a series of strokes can also lead to dementia. And then there are other less common types of dementia, things called Lewy bodies, or there's something called frontotemporal dementia. And although we like to put people in these boxes and say, unfortunately, you have dementia due to Alzheimer's disease or dementia due to vascular disease, when people get dementia in old age, typically they have contributions from a number of different factors. Uh, so when we do brain autopsies, often what we see is, even though someone might have been diagnosed with one type of dementia in life, when we look at their brain on autopsy, we typically see many different things going on in their brain contributing to dementia. So it really is a complex disorder. And this graph's just to show you, um, the black line shows your cognitive function as you get older. It's a simplified diagram, but essentially you can see that as you age, some degree of decline in cognitive function can be, inspect, can be expected. In fact, some aspects of cognitive function actually get better. So as people age, their vocabulary tends to increase, for example. But unfortunately, some aspects of cognitive function can decline. Um, but this is different to dementia. Dementia, although age is a big risk factor, Dementia is not a normal consequence or an inevitable consequence of aging itself. So actually what's really interesting and what's really challenging for us researchers is that you can see how these two lines diverge quite early. And what that shows is that actually the disease in the brain, the Alzheimer's disease in the brain that causes dementia starts 20 or 30 years before someone is diagnosed with dementia. So when someone comes into a clinic and they say, I've, I'm complaining of thinking problems and memory problems, and they get a diagnosis of dementia, they've actually been living in, with the disease in their brain probably for 20 or even 30 years. 
And this is really challenging because if you want to think about prevention, we can't be thinking about prevention two years before someone is diagnosed. We really have to be thinking decades before. And so I guess it's never too early to take responsibility for your health and start looking after your brain. Now, my research is really focused on understanding modifiable factors um, and risk factors. And I guess the motivation for that is because we don't have any drugs that can stop dementia. We don't have anything that halts dementia on a permanent basis. So we're interested in looking at risk factors and protective factors. So we can give guidelines and advice about the things that people should do to prevent their risk. Now, there are a lot of people working on drugs that can treat Alzheimer's disease and stop Alzheimer's disease. But I tend to think of dementia more like I think of heart disease in the sense that I, I don't sort of you know, think that people are looking for a drug that can cure heart disease. But what we've done is we've been able to characterize the disorder, understand the risk factors, know how to treat those risk factors, and therefore we're able to help people prevent their risk of getting heart disease. So I think of dementia in a similar way, and I hope that we can come to a better understanding of what its causes are so people can be well informed about what they need to do. So the research that I'm going to present to you today is based on a cohort called the Framingham Heart Study. And Dr. Seishadri is principal investigator of the Framingham Heart Study. So Framingham is a town in Massachusetts. And in 1948, there was a need to study the risk factors for heart disease. And so this Framingham Heart Study was, studied, uh, was started. Sorry. And what happened was there were about 5,000 participants who were enrolled. And these people have been followed right through to the present day, every two years. Surviving participants from the original cohort still get seen by the heart study. Then in the 70s, there was a need to study younger participants. So the heart study recruited the children of the original cohort. And now 5,000 children have been studied today. Then in 2002, they felt again there was a need to recruit a next generation of participants. So they enrolled grandchildren of the original cohort, or children of the offspring cohort. So now we have these three generations of participants. And here you can see, in the middle, actually three real participants from the Framingham Heart Study. And they all feel a tremendous, amount of, a tremendous amount of pride for being part of the study. Here you can see a plaque that's erected in the town of Framingham. It says, the town that changed America's heart. So there are many possible risk factors for dementia and Alzheimer's disease. This is not an exhaustive list. Um, it's just a few things that I put together to give you an idea of how complicated this is. So I mentioned that uh, age is associated with risk of dementia. Um, there are certain genetic factors which can increase the risk of de getting dementia in old age. Uh, certain health conditions like diabetes, uh, being highly educated seems to protect against getting <coughs> dementia. Uh, some people are interested in inflammation in the, in the brain and the role that that plays. Um, having an acquired brain injury, so getting a stroke, seems to increase risk of dementia. I'm going to focus in just on a few things, and I'm going to start off by talking about the role of sleep in dementia. So as we age, our sleep needs change quite dramatically. Anyone who's been a parent, I'm sure, will will recognize this quite obviously. So a newborn typically sleeps from 14 to 17 hours. And by the time that newborn reaches old age, they'll typically sleep from seven to eight hours on average a night. Now, sleep time is interesting because there's been some studies showing that people who sleep for short amounts of time, say less than five hours, and people who sleep for long amounts of time, say greater than nine hours, have an increased risk of dementia. But these studies have been small, and we wanted to investigate this further in the Framingham Heart Study. So we studied a large group of participants. We studied about 2,500 people. And we had a very simple research design. We simply asked people to tell us how long they typically slept for each night. And we then followed participants for the next 10 years to see who developed dementia. And now being Framingham, we're very fortunate to have data on these people going back a long time in the past. And it so happened that in the past, we also asked participants to indicate how long they typically slept for each night. And this allowed us to look at whether changes in sleep patterns were associated with the risk of dementia in old age. And so this is what we found. So we found that at that initial time point, people reporting sleeping for more than nine hours a night had twice the risk of developing dementia over the next 10 years. 
Now, interestingly, we didn't see an effect for short sleepers. So those people who said they didn't sleep that long, so less than five hours, did not have an increased risk of dementia. But we thought this association with long sleep is quite interesting. Is it the case that if you've always been a long sleeper, you would have an increased risk of dementia? And so what we did is we looked at those two time points, and if people said that they'd always been sleeping for more than nine hours each night, they didn't have an increased risk of dementia. But what we found was that people who transitioned over time from being a normal sleeper to being a long sleeper, these people had almost a two and a half increase in their risk of developing dementia over the next 10 years. And most strikingly, people who said they became long sleepers recently and they also had problems with thinking and memory, these people had a six times increase in their risk of dementia over the next 10 years. And essentially, we think that this is a marker along a pathway. In other words, we're not recommending that people restrict their sleep. We don't think that's going to have any effect. But rather, in some people who are having problems with thinking and memory, and the brain is starting to change in the early stages of dementia, sleep itself might change. And so sleep might be an indicator rather than a risk factor. Now, having said that, there are other aspects of sleep which we think might actually be related to the development of dementia itself. And sleep's quite interesting. There are a number of things we could talk about, but sort of the most talked about aspect of sleep at the moment is this ability of sleep to be able to clear out toxins from the brain. And I'm going to talk about that. So there's been these studies showing that actually when you sleep, there are these processes in the brain that help to clear out metabolic waste. So in Alzheimer's disease, there's this protein that becomes abnormal. And this protein is called amyloid beta. And it increases during the day just as a natural sort of uh, mechanism of being awake and thinking. And when you sleep, one of the functions seems to be that sleep helps clear out amyloid beta from the brain. And in fact, this is what this study shows, which was published in the journal Science. So amyloid beta was cleared twice as fast in sleeping mice as compared to awake mice. And so the authors thought, well, perhaps one of the restorative functions of sleep is that it can help remove potentially toxic waste from the brain. There was a follow-up study from a different group which showed that if you measure these levels of this protein, amyloid beta, and then you disrupt people's sleep over the course of a night, and then you measure these levels again in the morning, the more disrupted someone's sleep, the greater the increases in the levels of amyloid beta, which is, again, the protein that becomes abnormal in Alzheimer's disease. Now, these results are very interesting, but they don't suggest that, they don't show, sorry, that sleep is associated with dementia itself. They just show that it's associated with this protein. So in the Framingham Heart Study, we wanted to see whether aspects of sleep and sleep quality were related to the risk of getting dementia in the future. So we're very fortunate that uh, sometime in the past, it was, I think, around 95, uh, some participants from the Framingham Heart Study participated in an overnight sleep study. So members of the heart study went to the participants and they set them up with these uh, brain recording device that looked at their sleep waves and monitored them overnight. And from this, we were able to derive uh, how much time they spent in different sleep stages and able to look at their sleep quality. And then after this assessment, we followed participants up for an average of 12 years to see who developed dementia. So just as a brief, brief background to this, um, as we sleep, we cycle through different stages. So we tend to go into light stages of sleep first, stage one and two. I apologize if that's a bit hard to see. Uh, but then after we cycle through these light stages, we enter what's called stage three and four. And these are really our deep, deep stages of sleep. And this is where sort of the body does its repair. And then we enter what's called REM sleep. And this is a stage of sleep that people typically recall remembering their dreams. Um, it's called REM sleep because it's rapid eye movement sleep. This is where the eyes move rapidly and you also have some physiological changes like increases in blood pressure. Uh, and then the cycle repeats numerous times over the course of the night. And most people who are interested in sleep and its function about clearing out toxins are interested in these stage three and four, this deep sleep. So in our study, we looked at sleep quality in relation to the risk of getting dementia in the future. And interestingly, what we found was that 
People with less REM sleep had an increased risk of dementia in the future. In fact, each percentage reduction in REM sleep was associated with a 9% increase in the risk of developing dementia. Taking longer to get into REM sleep over the course of the night was also associated with an increased risk of dementia. And people that had more fragmented sleep, that is, they had more arousals, they woke up more during the night, also had an increased risk of dementia. Now, we looked at various things which might explain this association. So we looked at whether the results were due to things like people being depressed or certain medications that they were taking or certain underlying vascular diseases. And none of these factors could fully account for the observations that we saw. Now, it's important to, I should say, it's important to note that these studies that I'm talking about are observational, which means that we're observing that two things are associated, but we can't determine that one thing causes another. So we're seeing that REM sleep is associated with the risk of dementia, but we can't say that necessarily it's causally related. But nevertheless, I think it's important to think about how you might go about maximizing your sleep and improving your sleep, because if not for your brain, it's going to have sort of overall uh, benefits for health. And there are a number of things that you can do. So uh, one thing that's important is to make sleep regular. So if you have regular wake times and sleep times, this helps to uh, foster sleep. And maintaining those schedules on a weekend also helps. Uh, another thing that's important is getting exposure to light at the right time of the day. So getting adequate bright light in the mornings is a good thing. So I do a lot of international travel. And when I arrive in a new country, uh, the one thing that I try and do is wake myself up early and either go outside and go for a walk when the sun's coming up or at least sit by a window where I get natural light because that's the best thing to reset your body clock. But on the flip side, you don't want to get natural light, oh, sorry, you don't want to get artificial light when you're trying to go to bed. And this can be hard in a modern society where people are using cell phones and laptops. Um, but it's a good idea if you're having trouble getting to sleep to avoid those bright lights before you sleep. Uh, interestingly, it seems like the blue lights that are emitted from laptops and computers are the aspects of light that seem to reset the body clock the most. And there are these filters you can get. So I have a filter on my phone and on my laptop that cuts out the blue light so I can work on my laptop in the evening and potentially not affect my sleep cycle as much. Other things that are important are sort of keeping bed boundaries. So keeping your bed as a place for sleep and not associating it with other things which might cause you anxiety, such as um, doing work on your bed. And obviously, you want your sleeping environment to be comfortable. So you want a comfortable, cool, dark environment. Um, these things we call sleep hygiene, uh, they can be important for maximizing sleep, but they're certainly not a cure for a sleep disorder. So if anyone thinks that they're having problems with sleep, uh, it's a good idea to go speak to your doctor about it because there are treatments available for sleep disorders. The second aspect I'm going to talk about is cardiovascular health. And I guess this is where my, my passion began for dementia research. So there are a number of different ways to define cardiovascular health. Now, the American Heart Association recently came up with a way to quantify and measure ideal cardiovascular health. And this describes cardiovascular health according to a seven-point scale. And for each item, you can either be given a point of zero or you can get a point of one. So you can have really poor cardiovascular health, score of zero, right through to optimal or ideal cardiovascular health, a score of seven. So if you've never smoked or you quit more than a year ago, you get a point of one. If you have cholesterol that's optimal, that's below a certain threshold, you get another point. If you have a good BMI, which is a good weight relative to your height, you get another point. If you've got good blood sugars, you get one more point. If you engage in regular weekly physical activity, so 150 minutes of moderate intensity exercise or 75 minutes of vigorous intensity exercise, you get another point. If you've got blood pressure that's good, so less than 120 systolic or 80 diastolic, you get another point. And if you have a healthy diet, and there are a few things you have to meet here, this one's a bit more complicated, but essentially you have to have sufficient take, intake of fruits and vegetables. Uh, you have to have uh, fish a few times a week. 
you have to eat uh, whole fibers, like uh, whole grains, sorry, and you have to avoid excess salt in your diet, and you have to avoid drinking sugar-sweetened beverages. So if you do all those things, you get a point of seven. Now, I should point out that when we look at this in our studies, it's very rare to see people who obtain a perfect score of seven, but it, it's a good thing to strive towards. Now, there's been a number of studies showing that if you have higher scores on this ideal cardiovascular health metric, you have a lower risk of developing heart disease. And we know that the vascular health of the brain is really important for brain function. So if you think about it, the brain doesn't store any energy. It requires a constant supply of blood and oxygen to deliver also blood glucose so that your brain can work. So any disruption to that blood supply uh, can lead to cognitive problems. And the most obvious example of that would be in stroke. So in stroke, there's a sort of a deficit to the blood supply, and that's associated with very obvious changes in cognitive function. So in this study, we wanted to look at whether people who had better ideal cardiovascular health scores had better brain outcomes in the long term. So for this, we studied almost 3,000 people, and at our initial examination, they didn't have stroke and they didn't have dementia. We then measured the ideal cardiovascular health score. So everyone got a score from zero to seven. And we found that people who had higher scores had a lower risk of developing stroke and they had less decline in thinking skills. In particular, they had less decline in visual memory, which is your ability to remember sort of objects in space. And they had less decline in tasks measuring their ability to reason. We also found that people who had higher scores had less decline in frontal brain, uh, frontal brain volume. So frontal brain volume is the lobe of the brain here shown in blue. And it's responsible for a lot of different complex cognitive processes, such as your ability to reason, your ability to think abstractly, uh, your ability to monitor your own behavior. And we found that people who had a one point higher score on the ideal cardiovascular health metric um, they had reduced their rate of decline in their frontal brain volume to that of someone who was 3.4 years younger. So essentially the take home from this study was that adherence to the American Heart Association's ideal cardiovascular health guidelines and behaviors seemed to protect against vascular related brain injury, which in turn improved cognitive function. In the same study, we wanted to know whether people with better ideal cardiovascular health scores also had a lower risk of developing dementia. So for this study, we um, followed about 1,300 people who didn't have dementia uh, at the initial examination, and we followed them for 10 years to see who developed dementia. They were all older than 60, I should say. And we found that people who had higher scores had a lower risk of developing vascular dementia, and this was expected because Ideal cardiovascular, sorry, because uh, vascular dementia is due to vascular disease, essentially. But what was quite interesting was that people who had higher ideal cardiovascular health scores also had a lower risk of developing Alzheimer's disease dementia. And so the take home from this piece of the study was, well, what's good for your heart also seems to be very good for your brain. And adopting the ideal cardiovascular health behaviors and guidelines might protect your brain as well as your heart from vascular risk factors. Now, this is a study we, we've just finished. We haven't even submitted it for publication, so you're privileged to see, you're probably the first people to see these results. Um, it's a little bit complicated, the figures, so I'll walk you through it. Essentially, you have, on this axis here, the strength of association between someone's overall vascular health and their brain volume. So these zero line, if something's on that zero line, it means there's no association between vascular health and brain volume. But anything below the line means that vascular risk factors are associated with lower brain volume. And what you've got is the lines drawn for different decades of life. And what you can see is that, so here you've got 45 to 54, right through to 85 to 94. And you can see that it doesn't matter what decade you look at, but in each decade of life, higher vascular risk or having more vascular risk factors is associated with smaller brain volumes. But actually, the association changes with age, and it's actually much stronger in young people. So young people have 
high vascular risk seem to have lower brain volumes, that association is stronger. And so the take home from this is that um, vascular risk factors from a young age appear to be particularly important for brain function. So again, it's never too early to take ownership of your vascular health. So the last aspect I'm going to talk about is poor, uh, poor diet. Sorry. Okay, so I'm going to start off by talking about I'm going to, sugar. And uh, the main reason for that is we know that sugar intake is excessive in Western societies. Uh, when I first moved to the US, I was kind of shocked at how much sugar was in everything. Um, I'm not preaching to you because Australia has high rates of diabetes and obesity as well. Uh, but the serving sizes for sugary drinks were huge, and bread seems to taste like donuts. Uh, <laughs> but this is a problem because excess sugar in the diet is associated with cardiometabolic diseases. There's other things we talked about before high blood pressure, obesity, uh, poor cholesterol. And we know that those things, as I've shown you, are associated with bad effects on the brain. So we wanted to know whether having excess sugar in the diet was also associated with poor brain function. Um, and for this, we studied sugary beverages. And the main reason for that was it's very difficult for us to measure how much sugar someone has in their diet. So I can ask you, you know, what did you have to eat last week? And you might say, oh, I went to that restaurant, or I went to my sister's and she cooked me this. And from that information, it's very hard to actually measure how much sugar you're having. But people tend to be very good at uh, telling us how many sugary beverages they had. So we study this as a sort of proxy for how much sugar is in the diet. Because we know that sugary beverages are a major contributor to excess sugar. And I'd, I'd also just like to point out that it's not just Coke we're talking about. There are many other sources of sugary beverages. So for example, vitamin water and sports drinks and even fruit juice tend to be very high in sugar. Even unsweetened fruit juice is high in sugar. Um, and if you think about it, it makes sense because, you know, apples, oranges, fruit, it is very high in sugar, but it's also very high in fiber. So if I put a bowl of five apples in front of you, you might have one or maybe two, but then you get full. But if I squeeze the juice of five apples and gave you the glass of uh, apple juice, you could easily drink it and then still have your regular meals throughout the day. So having fruit juice is an excellent way to have lots of sugar from the fruit without getting the fiber, which makes you full. So in this study, we um, looked at people's sugary beverage intake and how it related to their brain function. So this was a very large study. We studied uh, over 4,000 people who had tests to look at their thinking and memory, and just under 4,000 people who also had a brain scan to look at their brain volumes. And this was a cross-sectional study, which means we looked at people's drinking habits, we then measured their brain volume, and we looked at their thinking and memory all around the same time. What we found was that people who more frequently consumed sugary beverages had lower overall brain volumes, and that's shown here. So here you can see that's people who had sugary beverages uh, more than twice per day. That's people who had it once to twice a day. And this is people that had it less than once a day. And you can see how as intake increases, brain volume decreases. To the right of that, you've got um, results for a task called logical memory. And this is how well you can remember information from a story. And the black bars are how well you can remember information from a story immediately. So the examiner will ask you to repeat the details of the story immediately. And the gray bars are after a delay. So how well can you remember information after a delay? And again, we see the same pattern of results. So if you look across the bars, those people who more frequently consume sugary drinks have uh, poorer logical memory performance, poorer performance on this task of memory. And what was interesting is, so those results were for sugary beverages altogether, all different sugary beverages. But even if we just look at fruit juice by itself, we see that people who more, con who more frequently consume fruit juice have smaller overall brain volumes, have smaller hippocampal volumes, which is an area of the brain important for memory consolidation, and they have poor performance on that task of memory associated with the story. Now, what was really interesting about this study was, uh, well, one of the things, we found that diet soda consumption was also associated with 
brain volume. So people who drank more diet soda also had smaller brain volumes. And to put these results in context, if we compare individuals who did not consume sugary beverages, people drinking one to two sugary drinks per day had brain volumes equivalent to someone 1.6 years older, whereas individuals consuming one diet soda per day had brain volumes equivalent to 2.5 years older, someone 2.5 years older. Now, I think these associations are important, but obviously it's important to keep in mind that this is an observational study, so we show these associations, but we don't necessarily demonstrate cause and effect. Now, as I mentioned, in that study, we looked at sugary drink intake and brain volume and thinking all at the same time. In this follow-up study, we wanted to look at how people's intake of sugary drinks and diet drinks related to their risk of getting dementia in the future, and also stroke, sorry. So we studied about 3,000 people over 10 years to see who developed um, stroke, and about 1,500 people older than 60 for 10 years to see who developed dementia. And also in this study, rather than asking people to indicate their dietary habits, their drinking habits, just once, we asked them to indicate this information three times over seven years. So we actually obtained a lot more information. And what we found was that people who were more frequently consuming diet drinks had a higher risk of developing stroke and a higher risk of developing dementia. In fact, people who were consuming diet drinks daily were three times as likely to develop stroke and were three times as likely to develop dementia. Now, as I mentioned a few times, uh, this is a, an associational study, so we can't um, <coughs> demonstrate cause and effect. So the, the obvious question to ask is, well, why would sugary drinks, or sorry, diet drinks, be associated with uh, the risk of stroke and the risk of dementia? And actually, I skipped that, but I should have mentioned we didn't see an association in this study with sugary drinks. It was just for diet drinks. I think one of the main reasons for that was, in this study, we didn't see a lot of people drinking sugary drinks. It wasn't a very common thing in our study. But so the obvious question to ask now is, well, why is intake of diet sodas associated with these outcomes? Um, and if you look at the body of evidence together, there's actually quite a few studies showing that higher intakes of diet sodas is associated with uh, different vascular risk factors and different vascular diseases, which I talked about earlier are associated with brain function. There's also been studies showing that higher intakes of uh, diet sodas and artificially sweetened drinks can lead to weight gain. Um, there was this one interesting study published in what's considered to be the top science journal showing that if you take, uh, I can't remember if it was rats or mice, but if you take, say, mice, and you feed them an artificial sweetener, it changes the bacteria in their gut and that this has influences on their risk of getting diabetes. There was also this one study which looked at rats and they were fed, so you had two groups of rats, they were both fed an identical diet, but one group had sweetened diets with artificial sweeteners, the other group had diets sweetened with sugar. And actually the, diet, the group that received the artificial sweetener, those rats ended up putting on more weight over the duration of the study, which is quite intriguing. And no one really understands the mechanisms for this or why this happens. So it's really something we need a bit more research on. So as with the ideal cardiovascular health, where we're able to put forward things and say, here is what you should do to reduce your risk of getting um, brain diseases. Moving forward, I'd like to be able to define the dietary things, the dietary patterns that people should be eating to protect their brain as they get older. And in fact, there have been a number of diets that have been studied with respect to the risk of dementia. Um, perhaps the most studied is something called the Mediterranean diet. So this is the diet that we think of when we think about the Mediterranean coast. So typically in this region, people consume high amounts of olive oil. They have olive oil as their oil. They don't typically consume butter or margarine or vegetable oils. They have a lot of fresh fruits and vegetables. They get a lot of legumes, a lot of nuts, uh, seeds and grains. Um, they eat fish multiple times a week. Wine in moderation and alcohol in moderation is okay. But they don't eat poultry, and sorry, they don't eat red meat. And they don't eat processed foods or junk foods. And this is typically the Mediterranean diet. 
And if you look at the body of evidence, that is, if you look across all the studies that have been published on the Mediterranean diet and the risk of uh, getting cognitive decline, so decline in thinking and memory, and the risk of getting dementia, it's quite consistent that studies show that people who have greater adherence to this Mediterranean-style diet have a lower risk of developing thinking problems and a lower risk of developing dementia. Now, this is a busy slide, but I just wanted to... It's essentially pointing out that there are a number of different diets out there. So the middle diet here is the, the Mediterranean diet that I talked about, and those are all the individual components. But then to the left of that, you've got another diet, which is called the DASH diet, or the dietary approaches to stop hypertension. And to the right of that, you've got the MIND diet, which is essentially a combination of the Mediterranean diet and the DASH diet put together. And what someone's done is they've taken all the aspects from those two diets they think are important for brain health and put them together into one diet. And that's what you have here. And essentially, it's very similar to the Mediterranean-style diet. Some of the main differences are an emphasis on green leafy vegetables, an emphasis on eating berries. And actually, it's also a little bit easier to adhere to because the Mediterranean diet requires you to have fish almost every day, whereas in the MIND diet, you only have to have it at least once a week. Now, there's been some research showing that people who have higher adherence to the MIND diet have a lower risk also of getting cognitive decline and of progressing to get dementia. And this is something we're just starting to look at in our study. And the early results look promising in that people who have higher scores on the MIND diet seem to have uh, better thinking and memory in the long term. Um, I know it can be confusing because you tend to hear you know, all these different diets uh, pop up all the time. But I think the take home message from this is that, well, essentially eating what you think is sensible. So, you know, fruits and vegetables and fresh foods um, and avoiding processed food seems to be the way to go. Okay, so to conclude, uh, we don't have any drugs to prevent dementia. And I think, I hope I've shown you that Alzheimer's disease is not only a disease of the old age. Uh, we've seen that risk factors in your middle-aged or midlife years can be associated with your risk of getting dementia later in life. So it's never too early to take ownership of your health, but likewise, it's never too late to start either. Now, all these things that I've talked about require further research, but getting adequate sleep, maintaining a healthy heart, and having a healthy diet are obviously common sense things you can do to improve your general health, and they might just help lower your risk of getting dementia too. So with that, I'd like to finish by thanking my collaborators. And first and foremost, I'd like to thank my mentor, Dr. Seishadri. Uh, none of this work would be possible without her amazing input. Um, and around her, we have really an excellent team of uh, biostatisticians and talented young researchers. So here we have Dr. Alexa Beiser, who is our head of biostatistics at the Framingham Heart Study. And then Dr. Jayendra Hamali ran most of the statistics for this analysis. And around them, you can see some other key members of our team. And of course, none of the work would be possible either without the dedication and hard work of the community. So thank you for your attention. <laughs>